Well, you know uh, that here you have a, an amazing group of, of faculty, and uh, I just want to encourage you uh, while you're here, soak up everything that you can from them. Learn from them, ask questions. They're here because they love you and they care about you. But I also want you to know that they are pretty passionate people, all right? Uh, last night, several of them joined into a very passionate game of catchphrase, uh, <clears throat> and it ended in somewhat of a controversial finish. So uh, there's still some, some dispute over which team actually won. The, the handoff was, was inconclusive, so we'll leave it at that. But I want you to be thinking this morning about what you're passionate about. What are you passionate about? Our, our word for today is going to be passion. Right? So as we, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and using the word passion to help frame our thoughts about that. But while you're thinking about what you're passionate about, I want you to see something that I'm passionate about. All right? All right, Hunter, Hunter's got the right shirt on today. Um, yes, I grew up just outside of the Philadelphia area in South Jersey. All right, yay, South Jersey. And uh, I'm a passionate Eagles fan, and I have a big announcement today that you may not be aware of, and that's this, that the Eagles won the Super Bowl this year. That's right. I waited a long, long time for that. And I enjoyed that. So just to give you a little uh, uh, awareness of what the passion, this is pre-Super Bowl. And you have to understand, I rescued my wife from a Redskins family. All right? Rescued her, brought her out, put her in green, right? And uh, she now pretends to like football. So, you know, I, I'll actually stop and rewind plays and, and she actually will look at them and say, that's nice, you know. <laughs> so she, she's kind. And this was uh, the kids before the Super Bowl. I'm raising them right. They, they love the Eagles. They hate Dallas. Um, sorry, but uh, if you wear Dallas clothes, they probably won't like you. Um, we actually flew uh, through the Dallas airport a, a year and a half or so ago, and my daughter was insistent that she wore an Eagle shirt when we went through Dallas, all right, because she wanted everyone to know uh, where she stood. And this was after the Super Bowl. Oh, oh Nate, let me get before the Super Bowl. Just to let you know my, my, my children's passion level, uh, we had invited some people over from church and uh, they were, we had a little competition to guess the score and so they were doing that and they decided that anyone that was rooting for the Patriots was going to be put in the pit of misery. So thank you uh, Bud Light for ruining my children and corrupting them. Um, and then uh, this was after the Super Bowl, all right? So you can see the, uh, the passion level was pretty excited. My kids were running around the house with an Eagles blanket. And Evan, my six-year-old, well, he had just turned six. He said, I have to go write my feelings down. So, <laughs> so it, it was a pretty, pretty passionate, passionate moment. So as we think about things that we're passionate about, I, I want us to think about our passion level for Jesus. And our, and our relationship with Him. Because while there might be a lot of things that you're passionate about in life, and listen, there should be some things that we're passionate about. Now, sports are great, but they're not the most important thing in the world. But there should be some passions that God has put in your heart, and you should pursue them, right? And pursue the things that God gives you a passion for, that are honoring to Him and pleasing to Him and glorifying to Him. But there should be one passion in our lives that is above every other passion. And that is our passion for our Savior. But one thing that I've noticed in my own life, and you may have as well, or maybe you're there right now, is that sometimes we realize there was a time or a season in our walk with Christ where we were passionate about Him, right? Where we were in love with Him and we felt that love and we were excited about living out our faith. But maybe something happened that caused your passion level for Jesus to diminish. Or maybe it just happened a little bit over time. And so this morning, I want us to, to look at God's Word and, and from His Word discover why we should have a passion for Jesus and, and what that looks like in our lives. So if you have your Bible, let's um, jump to our text. And, and from these verses this morning, I want us to see three key truths, three key aspects uh, of our salvation, of our relationship with God through Christ that ought to inspire passion in our hearts and our lives. So let's read God's Word together. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 8. It says, Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. For in love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. 
Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight and understanding. So as we look at, at this incredible passage, I, I want us to again notice three particular truths. There, there are more than three truths in these verses, but there is a time limit to chapel, so let's, let's consider three. First of all, I want us to think about the plan of God. Right now, in this text and in these verses, we see very clearly that, we ha there, that God has a plan. And our relationship with Him is part of that plan. Now, we could argue all day, and everybody has different opinions about predestination and free will. And, and we're not going to dive really into that. That's not what I want us to see this morning. right? But what we can see from the truth of this text, and as we look at, at verse 4 together, right, that we can be clear that God's Word says that our salvation, our relationship with God, was planned by God. Right? God has a plan. And his plan involves saving and redeeming a people for himself. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are part of that plan. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, I want us to focus then on why he did that. It says, so that we should be holy and blameless. Right? God chose you in Christ to be holy and blameless. Holy means to be a saint, to be set apart. Remember we talked about saints yesterday, that, we are, that Paul describes us as saints. Right? That we are holy and set apart. That, that's not something that you have to try to become. It's who God has made you. And then he calls us to live that out. You don't have to try to become a saint. Christ has made you a saint. You, you just need to understand who you are. And then be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live that out. But he says, not only to be holy, but to be blameless. And this means to be morally without fault. Right? And the way that we can be morally without fault is because Christ took our punishment. And Paul's going to get to that as we work through these verses. So he says, we've been chosen to be holy and to be blameless. And this really ought to motivate us, right? We all need motivation at times. How many of you need motivation sometimes to practice, all right? You will find plenty of that here. And trumpet players, let me just give you a word of caution. Do not try to cut your practice time short because your teacher can tell. All right, because she was my trumpet teacher when I was here. So, let me pass that on to you. We all need motivation sometimes, right? We, we need motivation. And I think this motivates us. As we think about why should I have a passion for Christ or how does my passion for Christ grow, right? It grows because of God's incredible plan, right? It grows because His plan was to make me holy and blameless, right? And that's my identity that He calls me to live out. Listen, we live in a culture that is anything but holy and blameless, isn't it? Right? We live in a culture much, like, like we said yesterday, like the church lived in Ephesus, where there is immorality, right? Everywhere that we look and everywhere that we go. But God in Christ has chosen you to be distinct and to be different, Right, and so he says, you've been chosen to be holy. God saves us to display the life of his son in us and through us. And he wants us to be his representatives in a world that needs to see him. So you need to understand this morning that God's plan in saving you is a plan to make you holy and blameless. And through the power of his spirit, he desires for you to live that out. And as we understand that plan, right, as we understand the, the, the incredible realities of this plan, it ought to cause us to have passion for Christ. Look at verse 5. Paul says, for in love, right? And, and here's, here's that's, it's so key because he says it was in the great love of God that he predestined us for adoption as sons, as daughters, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Listen, if you're in Christ, you are an adopted child. Right? And adoption, it's an amazing thing, right? Adoption is a beautiful thing, right? And, and when people on earth adopt children, they are reflecting the beauty of, of, of God's choosing to adopt us. Listen, there are no accidental adoptions, right? Like we talk about accidental pregnancies, right? Surprise pregnancies, right? Some of you were a surprise, right? Right? And you say, well, it shouldn't be a surprise. But, well, it was a surprise. <laughs> but there are no accidental adoptions. Right? It is a choice. 
And it's a costly choice, right? To adopt a child here in the United States, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. I don't know what the current number is, but a few years ago it was in the 30, in the 30 thousands, right? The, the, uh, the cost of adoption. Right? Adoption is expensive. It's a choice, and it's a choice made out of great love. It's a purposeful choice. And so Paul chooses to use this imagery and this language to help us understand our relationship with God, to understand his plan. And he says, God chose to adopt you. He chose to, to bring you into his family. He adopted you, and he adopted you at the great cost of the life of his son. He adopted you that you'd be holy and blameless, morally faultless. So this, this leads to his purpose, right? His purpose for us. So there's plan and then there's purpose. Look at verse 6 with me. God's purpose in saving you is to radically transform your life. He says, to the praise of his glorious grace he saved you, which he has, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Alright, God's plan involves his purpose. And his purpose was that our lives might bring God glory. Right? That ultimately our salvation, our relationship with God, it is ultimately about God's glory. It's about his praise. Remember we, we encountered that word praise or eulogy yesterday in, in verse 3? And so here Paul's using that, that word to help us understand Right? What our purpose is. That we might bring praise to God. That we would praise His what? His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. He's blessed us with grace. Right? We said yesterday that He's blessed us in so many ways. But one of the ways that He's blessed us, that He's blessed us with grace. Grace is undeserved favor. Getting what you don't deserve. And in Christ, you've been given not just salvation, but you've been given relationship with God. You've been given the opportunity to know the God of the universe, the one who created you and made you, the one who sustains you, the one who sustains the entire universe by his power. He's given you the ability to know him. He has blessed you with his grace. His purpose in that is that you might praise him. Ephesians 1.3 just reminding you from yesterday. It says, blessed, right? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has what? Blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Right? There is a plan. There is purpose. Right? God has a purpose for you. We're going to get more specific about that on Friday. But the general purpose of your life is to bring glory to God. And that's an incredible privilege. And that ought to motivate us to live with passion. To say, I ought to have a passion for Jesus. Why? Because he has a plan. And that plan involved him choosing me and adopting me. Right? At the great cost of his son. That, that God purposely chose me and brought me into his family. That he sought me. Right? When I was far from him. And he brought me into a relationship. And there's a purpose for my life. I'm here to bring glory and honor and praise to the one who has blessed me with his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. How did he do that? The third truth I want you to have is provision. Provision. Now, provision can mean several things, but it can mean, one of its definitions is a condition or requirement in a legal document. A condition or requirement in a legal document. Right? When athletes sign contracts, there's all kinds of provisions right in there. There are legal language in those contracts that specify certain things. So God has made provision. A legal requirement has been made for us to have relationship with him. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says, In him we have redemption, that's a, an important word, through the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, upon us in all wisdom, insight, and understanding. Listen, we said that legally, before God, you and I are guilty, right? We have sinned. We have rebelled against him. There is guilt. We are, we are, the Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. We're separated from God's love and his goodness, although he desires for us to know it. And so Jesus came to be the provision for our sin, right? He lived for you. He died for you, right? He rose from the dead for you. Jesus came to be that provision, to redeem you. That, that word means to buy back. 
Uh, I read a story uh, a little while ago. It's an older story, and it, it talked about a young boy who loved, he loved boats and he loved sailing, and so he and his dad uh, built this beautiful model sailboat. And it was designed to actually sail. And so they lived near a lake. It was a, a pretty good-sized lake. And they would take it down to the edge of the lake and put it in the water and, and play with it. Well, one day it was fairly windy, and they were playing with the boat, and it got away from them, and they couldn't retrieve it. And the boy was very sad. And he would go out every day and walk around the shore of the lake looking for his boat and never found it. Well, one day he was in a store nearby, and lo and behold, in that store he saw his boat. And he couldn't believe it. And so he went to the owner of the store and he said, uh, I got to tell you, that that's my boat. You know, I built that boat with my dad and, and I lost it. And, and the store owner said, well, a fisherman brought that boat in and I paid good money for it. So if you want it back, you're going to have to pay for it. So the little boy went and uh, did all that he could to earn the money to buy that boat back. And then finally he had enough money. He went back and he bought that boat. And as he clinched it tightly on the way home, he says, I love you even more now for I made you and I bought you. You're twice mine now. And you need to understand that's how God sees you. He made you. He created you. He formed and fashioned your life. But even though you rebelled against Him and even though, like me, you are a sinful person, He chose to buy you back at the cost of His Son. He chose to redeem you. And understanding that and, and, and re remembering that and bringing that back into the focus of our hearts and our minds ought to well up passion in our hearts and in our lives for Christ, realizing the cost that Jesus paid for us, that we've been redeemed by His blood. And look at what it says there. It says that we have forgiveness of our trespasses, of our sins. But then it says, according to the riches... Right? According to the riches of His grace. Not out of the riches of His grace. Right? You can give out of your riches. If I were, let's just say I was a billionaire. Right? That's a nice thought, right? I promise you I am not. But if I was, and, and I said, I want to make a generous donation to Chehi Summer School of Music. They'd probably accept it, right? I'm going to give $100. <laughs> How many of you think that sounds generous? Anybody? Not very generous at all. I'm a billionaire, right? $100 isn't generous, right? Like that's, that's like less than pocket change. But that would be giving out of my riches. Right? But if I gave according to my riches, right? I'm a billionaire, I'd say, I'd like to give $5 million to Chehi Summer School of Music. Okay. Right? <laughs> you accept? Right? That would be what? That would give, be giving according to my riches. That's what Christ did for you. He gives according to his riches. He has, look at verse 8, he has lavished his grace on you. How many of you think lavish is a cool word? Anybody? All right, that's just like a good word, right? There, there are words that some words are just like, that's a good word. Lavish. He has lavished his grace on you. Lavish means to be elaborate, to be extravagant, to be over the top. Right? He has gone over the top in giving us grace. Why? Because He doesn't just give us grace for our past when He saves us, but He gives us grace for our present and He gives us grace for our future. Right? Because when God chose you, right, He knew everything about you, past, present, and future. Right? And when God chose you, when God adopted you in Him, He knew, listen, He knew all about what you would do even after He saved you. He knew about your failures. He knew about the times that you would disappoint Him. He knew about the times that, that you would sin against Him and rebel against Him, even though you're His child. And you know what? It didn't stop Him from choosing you. It didn't stop Him from offering His grace to you. And listen, He never regrets His choice. God never looks at you and regrets saving you. God never looks at you and regrets what He's done for you. Because He loves you with an everlasting love. And He has lavished His grace and His mercy on you, and that ought to lead us to passionate lives. But even though all of that is true, sometimes we lose our passion, don't we? Sometimes our, our passion for Jesus just isn't there. And, and that happened to the church that Paul was writing to, right? Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. He knew them, he loved them, he wanted them to be on fire for Jesus. But just about 30 years later, John writes to the church, at Ephesus, and he says this, I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people, and you've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles, but they're not. 
You've discovered they're liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you first did. Look how far you've fallen from your first love. Turn back to me again and work as you did at first. For if you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand from among its place among the churches. They had lost their passion for Jesus. Right? They were still doing the right things. They were, they were going through the motion. They believed the right things. But their passion, their love for Jesus had cooled. I don't know the reason, but I know the reason that's most often for us is that we lose sight of. Right? We lose sight of what Jesus has done for us. We take for granted what he's done for us. And so I, I want you, while you're here at camp, to be thinking about what is it, right? What is it that it may be keeping me from being passionate for God? And, and as you're thinking about that, I, I don't want you to lose sight of his plan. That he chose you in him to be holy and blameless. That he made, that he has a purpose, that it would be for the praise of his glory in his grace and that he made provision for you through the gospel. His purpose is to impart his life to you. Right? The hymn writer Thomas Chisholm said this. He said, Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. He's made provision for you. He has a plan for you. And he wants you to be passionate about him. When I came to camp, right, in 1995, all right, I'll just throw that out there. Right, I knew Jesus as my Savior. Right, and, and, and as Graham alluded to Sunday night, I came because my sister had come for three years. She wanted me to come. I didn't want to go. And she said, there is a significantly higher percentage of girls than boys. <laughs> and I said, maybe I need to go. Right, the ratio is about 2.5 to 1 back then. I said, I can live with those odds. So I came. That was sort of the motivation. But here's the thing. God has a plan. And whether our motivations are great or not great, God knows exactly what he's doing. And he placed me in a place that I needed to be. And God began to change my life while I was here. And one of the things that he did was to awaken in my heart a realization that I didn't have a passion for him. Right? Because I wasn't living for him. I wasn't living out my faith. And God through through, through many different experiences, but really through looking at fellow campers and students, made me realize that I needed to have a passion for Jesus. And God began to do that in my life while I was here. And what God has done for, for me here, I, I have been praying that God would do for you and that he would do for me again. Listen, because we never outgrow our need to have our passion for Jesus renewed and refreshed. Right? We never outgrow that need. And so... I just want you to think about your passion level for Jesus. And as you do, I want to share with you the words that Isaac Watts wrote in 1707. As you think about the passion that we ought to have for Jesus. He said, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut its glories in when God the mighty maker died for his own creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. But drops of tears can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. A young woman in her 20s named Fanny Crosby heard that song one night. And although she had heard the gospel before many times, nothing had ever changed in her heart and her life. But she said that that night, on hearing that last stanza, she said, something changed in my heart. She said this, she said, I felt that my very soul was flooded with celestial light and said she leapt to her feet and shouted, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And she said this, she said, I realized that I had been trying to hold on to the world in one hand and the Lord in the other. Listen, you'll never have a passion for Jesus if you're trying to hold on to something that God's calling you to let go. And I don't know what that is for you. For me, it was because I was worried about what people would think about me if I lived out my faith seriously. And I realized that I was trying to hold on to that. 
So I want you to think about what is it that you're holding on to that you need to let go so that your passion for Jesus can be the most important thing in your life. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for you and us and me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege that we have to be here together this morning. Father, I pray that, that you might overwhelm our hearts this morning with the passion that we should have for you. Father, help us to see the plan and the purpose and the provision that you've made for us and may that well up passion in our hearts. And Father, I pray that if there's something that we're trying to hold on to in our life that, that you're calling us to let go, that you would reveal that to us. Father, so that our passion for you might be the greatest passion of our life and that we might serve you with passion, never forgetting what you've done for us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.